Well, good morning, church. Well, friends, the Christmas story has been shared and nuanced in many ways. One of the longest standing traditions in many churches is the Christmas pageant or the live nativity. And this is the opportunity to live act the events that unfolded surrounding Christ's birth in Bethlehem. From the cast of characters to the sets and the props, Christians try to set the stage so that they might remember and reflect upon the birth of the Savior. This year, we're going to take a look at some of the props from the Christmas pageant as they have lessons to share with us. From being ready and prepared for God's action in our lives to opening our lives and our homes to bringing our best to the King, we'll learn that this story is bigger than costumes, set designs, and stage props. This story has implications for us at Advent and all throughout the year. This story changed everything. That first Christmas, the characters in our story were living under godless Roman laws. Political corruption and greed ruled the day, and people were primarily concerned about taking care of themselves. Everyone was just a little on edge. They didn't know what was coming around the next bend. And in today's world, we have seen political grandstanding both at home and around the world. Bombs have gone off at a marathon and sporting events. People have opened fire in office places, college campuses, schools, movie theaters, and shopping malls. Natural disaster has affected every corner of the globe. And the global economy is still a subject of uncertainty. 2,000 years after the birth of Jesus, godless laws... Political corruption and greed still rule the day. People are largely concerned about taking care of themselves and people are just a little on edge, not sure what might be coming next. Unlike that peaceful backdrop that often accompanies the Christmas pageant, the setting of this scene was one of fear, despair, and hopelessness. This is where the story comes to life. For us, this Advent, in a world filled with uncertainty, God's plan was about to unfold. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Luke and the book of Acts of the Apostles make up, about a, two, or make up a two-volume work from the same pen that has come to be known by scholars as Luke-Acts. And together they account for over 27% of the New Testament, the largest contribution of a single author, providing the framework for the church's liturgical calendar and historical outline onto which later generations have fitted their idea of the story of Jesus. The cornerstone of Luke-Acts theology is something called salvation history, which is the author's understanding that God's purposes have been seen in the way he has acted and in the way God will continue to act in history. We're going to look at verses 5 through 22. Hear these words. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at his right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great. In the sight of the Lord, he must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. And when he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. We tend to think of angels as, well, angelic. Pretty faces, cherub-like. But perhaps the angels weren't so friendly looking. Maybe they were. Either way, if we started hearing voices or saw a figure claiming to be a messenger from God, we would likely be very unsettled. We might check the date on the milk carton, schedule an appointment with our doctor, or maybe even need a change of pants. The fear of these folks, it's understandable. And these characters weren't only jumpy because the messengers of God were visiting them. the world around them. It was a scary place, especially for a Jew. You see, the first Christmas, it didn't happen in this safe, rosy little Norman Rockwell-type world. Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem because Caesar was taxing the world to feed the very army that he was using to oppress their people. When their baby was born, they had to leave Bethlehem and flee to Egypt because Herod had plotted to murder their baby. When he couldn't find them, he ordered a mass execution of baby boys, hoping that one of them would be this new king that he was so afraid of. Fast forward a little bit, and the wise men had to return home on a different route because Herod was after them as well. Still later, John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, would lose his head. Eleven of Jesus' disciples would be put to death for their faith. And some of the earliest Christian missionaries like Stephen and Paul were also sentenced to death for their witness. Now, in our culture, angels are often depicted as bright figures that have halos and wings and wear long, flowing robes or dresses. Many people think of angels similarly to the way that fairies are depicted in major motion pictures. These images, they're far from frightening. And yet, every time an angel appears in the Bible, people are generally terrified by the angel's presence. This has led to recent depictions of angels looking something like a grim reaper. And while the Bible does give us some clues as to the physical characteristic of angels, like their spirits, and that they lack flesh and bones, and while Hollywood imaginations run wild, it's difficult for us to accurately depict what an angel actually would look like should we be visited by one ourselves. But regardless of appearance, we do know that encounters with angels frightened people. But scripture does show us that God has sent angels in a variety of ways. Angels serve as protectors. In Genesis, we read the story of Lot and two angels came to visit him in the evening and he bowed down to them and invited them to stay at his place. And when the elders of the community wanted to question his visitors, Lot tried to protect them, but to no avail. And the angels act And they struck the elders blind so that they could not break into the home. They had to bring punishment on the city and sent Lot with his family out of the city to get to safety before Sodom was destroyed. Angels serve as providers. In the book of 1 Kings, we read that Elijah was on the run from Jezebel who was seeking to kill him. And while he was sleeping, an angel came to Elijah and woke him up and told him to eat, for he needed strength for his journey. When he woke up, he found a cake laying beside his head, and he ate it. And there was a jar of water as well, and he drank it. And he fell back asleep and resumed his journey the next morning. And it is reported that the cake and the water provided him with sustenance for 40 days. Angels serve as comforters. 
encouragers and strengtheners. Daniel caught a vision from God, but when he heard the voice of God telling him to pay attention to what God was saying, he was incredibly frightened. And as he was processing, he said to this angel who appeared to him in human form that he was unable to speak. So the angel touched him that he might speak. And Daniel told God that the vision was incredibly worrisome for him, that he was weak. And the angel touched him again. And Daniel was given the strength, told that he was safe, and that he should have strength and courage in the face of what he would encounter as he fulfilled and lived into this vision that God was giving to him. Angels serve as messengers. An angel visited Zechariah and Elizabeth to proclaim the birth of John the Baptist. An angel visited Mary to deliver the news that she would give birth to the Savior of the world. Joseph, appalled that his betrothed was pregnant, thought about stoning her, but determined instead to end their engagement quietly. Just then an angel visited him, told him to stick with her. She had been given a very important role in God's bigger plan for humanity. There were shepherds who were just watching their flocks by night. An angel visited them with good news of great joy that unto them a Savior had been born. In every single instance, the characters in the story were immediately frightened by the presence of the angels. And despite that fear, the angel's message was clear. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. I remember the children's Christmas programs growing up. I loved rehearsing and memorizing my lines. I enjoyed Saturday morning rehearsals. And then the night of the production came and the adults would drop us off in the nursery and head to the fellowship hall. And in the nursery, we would don our costumes and then we'd walk the short distance outside from the choir room to the back entrance of the fellowship hall. And I remember the shushes as we entered the backstage area and awaited our moment in the spotlight. Every year, the night ended with the entire cast on stage singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas to our parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and our church family. And once we'd finished singing, the doors of the fellowship hall flung open, the house lights were turned up, and in walked Santa Claus. For a couple of years, I was cast as one of the shepherds. And one year, a kid older than me decided to get into a sword fight with me with our foam shepherd crooks. And my crook broke off at the end. So when it came for my moment on the stage, I was the only shepherd without a staff. And my eyes were still puffy from crying backstage in embarrassment. My dream was to become an angel. I thought they had the nicest costumes and they got to be on stage throughout the entire production. And then one year, my dream came true. I landed the part of Gabriel. We had white robes with gold trim and wire halos covered in gold garland. And the only catch was that no one told me how those halos were secured to our heads. I will never forget the pain I experienced when my Sunday school teacher Mimi practically scalped me when attaching my halo with bobby pins. Oh, did they hurt. My final two years in the Christmas pageant, I received the wonderful role of narrator. I got to keep my script in front of me, no lines to memorize, no costume to wear, just me and my Sunday best at the podium. Now that was the life. But those bobby pins, they stung. And when I think about it hard enough, I can still feel them being driven into my scalp. But pain was experienced by each of the characters in the Christmas story. Each of them living their lives quietly, just trying to remain unnoticed, trying to make the best of things. And then God called and their lives were completely disrupted. Elizabeth and Mary experienced the pain of childbirth. Joseph experienced the initial thoughts of betrayal and no doubt experienced ridicule for choosing to stick by Mary. Zachariah was unable to speak during the entirety of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And we tend to think of God's call as this nice, peaceful event. But to be truthful, sometimes God's call is painful for us to receive. It might mean that we have to give up something worldly. It might mean going down some kind of a path of uncertainty. It might mean doing the thing that's not popular. 
And sometimes when God calls, it just plain disrupts our lives. And it might feel like someone's driving bobby pins into our head. And sometimes the people who were visited by the angels questioned out of fear. Zechariah not only questions the angel, but actually argued with him, saying, my wife, she's old. He was silenced for nine months. The apostle Paul persecuted Christians in the early church, and he was struck down for his actions to get his attention before he became one of the greatest Christian missionaries the world has ever known. When I was called to ministry, I told God I was going to be a teacher and that if ministry was in the cards, I would get to it someday. But the doors kept closing until this was the only path I could follow. In the Christmas pageant, there are all sorts of lines to memorize. And while outtakes are funny and cute from the littlest children, sometimes the message is best communicated when we stick to the script. Because God has plans for us. God has plans for you. God has plans for me. And God has plans for our church. Are we going to ad lib? Are we going to rewrite the script? Are we going to argue with the director or the creative department? What would it look like to just stick to the script? Yes, sometimes God's call can be fear-inducing. Yes, the call can be disruptive. And yes, the call can cause us to have to make some sacrifices, some of them painful. But when we follow God's call, when we trust in God, amazing and great things happen. By following the call, John the Baptist was born and paved the way for Jesus. By following the call, Mary gave birth to Jesus with Joseph at her side. By following the call, the shepherds got to witness a miracle. By following the call, I was placed on a path that led me here to you, one of the greatest blessings of my life. The call can be disruptive. It can be painful at first. But God provides abundant blessings to those who follow the call. As I close this morning, I want to share just a few thoughts about what you can do when God calls. These steps might not reduce all your fear or anxiety or pain, but maybe they'll help you to respond rather than react when it appears that God is turning your world upside down. Step one, pause. It's that simple. Take a deep breath. What is it that God is calling you to do? What will it require you to risk? What will be the reward? What concerns do you have? Step two, pray. Ask God to help you discern the specific call he is giving you. Share those concerns with him. Let him know your fears. Remember to listen first and then speak. Let God speak into your heart and then ask him for whatever you need in order to fulfill his call. Step three, accept. Even in great fear, every character in the Christmas story followed the call of God. Trust that God is bigger than your fears. And remember that God is faithful to those who are faithful. Yes, stepping out in faith is risky at times, but accept the call that God places on your life and step into the adventure of a lifetime. Step four, act. Once you've accepted God's call, the next thing to do is act. Find out what God wants you to do and start doing it. It's that simple. Throughout Scripture, Angels act for the plans and purposes of God. And when our wills and lives intersect with something that God is doing, it might mean that our course is corrected or taken in a different direction. When our lives take an unexpected turn, fear can quickly rise up. But God has huge and big plans for each of us, and God has big plans for our church. These plans might not be communicated via an angel visit, but they might be discerned through prayer or careful study of Scripture. When God called Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, each demonstrated a faithful response. Do not fear God's big plan for your life. Rather, pause to reflect. Pray for understanding and clarification. Accept God's movement and direction and act accordingly. This morning, as you came in, you received a piece of gold tinsel. And each week with this series, we're going to give you something to take home. And I would encourage you when you look at this to remember that halo, to remember those bobby pins, to remember that God's call is not always comfortable. Sometimes it causes us pain. But when you look at this, 
remember to pause, to pray, to accept, and to act. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the season of Advent and the hope that it brings to our lives. While we know the outcome of the events that unfolded so long ago, help us to put ourselves in the story this year as though we are experiencing it for the first time. Help us to feel the fear and uncertainty. Help us to sense the excitement of good news, of great joy. Help us to follow your plans for our lives, no matter how far-fetched they might seem. Help us this Advent to see these props come to life in new ways so that we might come to more deeply appreciate the greatest gift we have ever been given. In your name we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, just a few uh, parting words before our blessing. I would remind you that at 1 o'clock today, Nicole will be preaching the sermon that she has to write and prepare for her ordination paperwork. So if you would like to join us at 1 o'clock in here, um, it will just be the sermon. Uh, I, I told her if she needed a warm-up act, I'd try. But, uh, so she'll be preaching at one here, and then afterwards we'll be gathering for a time of fellowship at Olive Garden to kind of celebrate uh, this milestone and getting the paperwork completed. We also um, invite you and welcome you into our home this Friday from 4 until 8. The trees are up. Nicole will be baking this week. Uh, you need not bring anything but yourselves. This is our Christmas gift to you, our way of saying thanks to both of our congregations for who you are. And my friends, if you need someone to pray with you this morning, our Hope Prayer Servants are up front. They are happy to pray with you. My friends, God is calling. Pause, pray, accept, and act. And may God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you as you do. We'll see you next week.